We're live? Oh, good morning. We need a red light or something. How's everyone this morning? I pray that you all brought your Bible with you this morning. We're going to read a lot of scripture this morning. Is that all right? We could, lead a, we, <laughs> we could read a lot of scripture this morning, or we could read some Mother Goose. Which do you prefer? Scripture. scripture. Good. We're on the same page this morning. Good morning if you're viewing us this morning. By way of Ustream, we welcome you this morning. I would like to address those that are watching uh, this video right now. I want to encourage you, if you are being touched by the videos and the teachings that we've been doing, please consider sharing these videos on your social media. We would like to reach as many people as possible with the word, with the truth, with the power that changes people's lives and sets them free. Amen? I thank you for doing that. Give the Lord a praise for our Ustream audience. I think there's four people watching. Amen. I know we have someone who faithfully watches from San Diego. We're going to call him Mr. T. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We even thank you for the words that, of encouragement that we've already heard this morning. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the teacher, that you are the one who wrote the word. You're the author of the word, and you teach us the word. We ask you even now to begin to teach us and to reveal to us, to illuminate and give us revelation this morning of your word. I ask you, Holy Spirit, even bring conviction and convincing in the areas where we need to change to allow your fame to go throughout this earth, Lord. Lord, I thank you that there's an anointing here today, an anointing for change upon your word. I thank you even for anointing from the miraculous here this morning. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah? Blessed be the name of the Lord. A couple of weeks ago, I had mentioned about the 12 spies. Remember? Remember when I uh, accidentally referred to Joshua and Caleb as Paul and Silas? I don't know where that came from, but, you know. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the 12 spies this morning. In God leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, he promised them numerous times about bringing them to a new place, a land that flowed with milk and honey, right? And he spoke it and spoke it, and they did their own thing, and they murmured, they complained, they wished they were dead, they wished they were back in Egypt, they're going to starve, they're going to die, you know. And every time God constantly proved himself to his people, right? Constantly, constantly, constantly proved himself. And it gets to the place where now Moses is going to send these spies in. And he gets the 12 spies and they go into the land and they scout out the land in Numbers chapter 13. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But the spies returned. In verse 26 of, of chapter 13. So after exploring the land 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they seen and showed them the fruits of what was taken in the land. Notice they reported the things they seen. This was their report. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it indeed is a beautiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. Verse 28. But. Does your Bible say but? Nevertheless. Nevertheless but. The people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there and the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. Right? So here we go. 
God has promised, God has spoken, God has promised, God has spoken. God said, I'm going to give you this land. God said, I'm going to give you this. God said, this is yours. This is my promise. This is yours. All you have to do is go take it. This is yours. Right? All you have to do is take it. All you have to do is believe me. Take it. All you have to do is trust in what I'm telling you. I am giving you a present. Take it. And they went in and sure, sure, sure. But they came back and said, but. And they went down the list of impossibilities why they can't take that land. There's giants in the land. Right? But. The people are powerful. But then there's a counter but in verse 30. Caleb. It says, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as he stood before Moses. He goes, let's go at once and take the land. We can certainly conquer all. Right? But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we. Verse 32. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. Interesting. They spread the bad report. How many of you know bad news travels fast? Bad news travels fast. Here they are, the spies come back and they report back to their leadership. Yeah, here's some grapes. They're pretty big, right? Grapes are as big as your head, right? But there's problems in the land. And what do they do? They go and tell the people. They went and told all the Israelites, and the bad news spread throughout the land. Amen? They were tuning in to CNN, Carnal News Network. <laughs> Amen? And just like even Mom was saying a few minutes ago, we need to make sure that what we're hearing, not just from the news, but what we're hearing lines up with what God is saying. Amen? They went ahead with a bad report. Your Bible might say an evil report. What does your Bible say? Bad report, evil report. Either way, they had nothing good to say. They had a defeated mentality. And the reason why they had a defeated mentality was plain and simple. They were just carnal. They were just natural. They didn't believe what God had already spoke. They chose to believe the report of man. They chose to believe what man had to say over what God had to say. We're not much different today as people. We live in a modern society. And we, although we may not be trying to conquer and take over New Jersey, we tend to believe the things we hear over what God has said over the promises of God and we put more faith in those things. So the bad report, the word bad report means to slander. To slander. They spread the word of slander. That word also means defaming. Defaming. What does it mean to defame? It means to damage somebody's good name, their reputation, or their character. Their negative report was a slander against God. They slandered God because they chose to live by sight and not according to the promises or the word of God. They choose to put more faith in their circumstance than they did in what God promised them. Right? So what they did was they slandered God because they went to the rest of the children of God and told them in so many words, God's wrong. God's wrong. And this caused God to want to wipe them all out. Right? Numbers 14. 
starting in verse 1. Because what had happened up to this point, you know, Joshua and Caleb had the good report, but they had a negative report. And verse 13 ends with a, with a, with a verse that says, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. We were like grasshoppers. We were just so insignificant in the sight of these giants. We don't feel like we could have victory. We don't feel like that we'll ever take the land. Logic dictates that we'll never have victory in this situation. Oh, faithless generation. You see, the 10 spies had unbelief. The 10 spies did not believe what God had spoken. Verse 1, New Living Translation of Numbers 14. Then the whole community began weeping out loud, and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. You see, what happened, these 10 spies infected everybody. And now they were, here they go, let's, let's get rid of our leaders. It's always the pastor's fault. It's always the prophet. Let's stone them. Let's get them out of office. Let's do away with them. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Oh, our wives and little ones will be carried off as plunder. Boy, they haven't even entered in, and they're already saying that their families are going to be taken away, their wives are going to be raped and murdered, you know. They haven't even gone in. They got more faith in an evil report before they even stepped into the land. You see, the devil, or your best friends, or the people on your internet, will always talk you out of God's best. They will always form an opinion through reasoning why you can't have that, why you can't prosper, why you can't be healed. I had a conversation with somebody here in the church about five weeks ago. And the person said to me, you know, I have a problem with that healing stuff you talk about. You do. Yeah, I know plenty of people that God never healed of AIDS. I said, I know people that got healed of AIDS. Yeah, prove it. I want a written report from their doctor. You know, sometimes we become so stubborn in our own carnal thinking. And according to history and the life we've lived, that we are a faithless generation at times. Can I get an amen somewhere? And we being a church that bases everything we do on the word of faith should never be people of limitation. A lot of times we look for more reasons why we can't than truly standing on the word and just receiving what he has for us. I don't know. Believing for what he has or making the decision to do contrary, I think it's more work to do contrary than just to stand in a place of receiving and believing. Amen? We are the overcoming church. God says, and I said it before, he said we are those who trample on serpents and scorpions. We are those that have the devil under our feet. But we don't have circumstances under our feet. Well, why not? Well, it's not as big as the devil. It's the little stuff. It's the everyday stuff. It's the little stuff that we don't recognize that cuts us off from the power and the blessing and causes us not to walk in the power of the word as promised. It could be carnality. You could be just a fleshy Christian. And I'm not talking to anyone here at Pillars of Faith. I'm talking to that one guy in, in Idaho that's watching right now. Don't you love me? Well, I love you too. Amen? Amen. So our wives and our little ones are going to be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us just to return to Egypt? You know how many Christians say, wouldn't it be better just to go serve the devil? You know how many Christians just give up and turn their backs on God? That's exactly what they're saying. It was so much better in Egypt. You know, symbolically speaking, Egypt represents the world, and we've been delivered out of the world. Pharaoh represented the devil. 
we've been the, set free from the devil and set free from the world. But a lot of times, because we don't walk in victory or we don't see the power of God in our lives, what we do is we blame God. We blame God and say, God, you don't work. I'm going back to the devil, going back to Egypt, going back to my old ways, going to start drinking, going to start smoking, going to start lusting, going to start doing all these different things because you didn't satisfy me or you didn't do it my way. Boo hoo hoo. It's time, as they would say in the world, to man up. It's time to rise above your natural thinking, which the Bible would call stinking thinking, and start walking in the spirit. Amen? Amen. You guys, are, where, where, where's he going this morning? <sighs> then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader. Let's find a new church. Let's find a new church. Well, let's go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell down on their, on their face on the ground before the whole community of Israel. They didn't throw themselves down because they were quitting. They threw themselves down as an act of humility. Okay? It wasn't they threw themselves down in frustration. They didn't grab their chest and have heart attacks. They grew, threw themselves down on the floor as an act of humility before them and as well as God. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua son of Nun, Caleb son of Jephana, tore their clothes. And they said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land. Listen, they are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Amen? Amen. Now, we could look at this many different ways in our own personal life. We could look at this at the souls that we're about to gather into the kingdom. We could look at this at our family members. We could look at this as basically... All the people who have degrees on their wall but don't know anything about the things of God. You're all the ones that label you with incurables. Amen. Amen? You know, the ones that label you with incurables. Oh, you got arthritis. That never goes away. <laughs> Jesus bore your arthritis so you don't have to have arthritis. Amen. Diabetes. Well, you know, you better buy those shoes and those special socks. What are you preparing for death? Or you just stand in faith and start rising above what man has dictated to you through reason and logic to bring you to a greater level of unbelief and reverse that and rise up to a greater level of faith. Now, did I say to ignore your doctors? No, I didn't say to ignore your doctor, but you need to put more faith in the report of the Lord than you do your doctor. Amen? Amen? The doctors are good, but Jesus was the great physician. No one tops the great. Everyone else is second... Best. I'd rather put my, my trust in the prescription that Jesus has for us. Amen. Amen? So what these two men had, besides revelation, besides having faith, besides truly being believers of the word, not hearers only, acting upon it, these men had a bold confidence in their God. They were bold. Turn to your neighbor and say, sounds like you. I didn't say old, I said bold. <laughs> Amen? God has no old people in his kingdom. Because he says, if you get old, I'll just renew your youth. Right? And all those over 49 said amen. Next year I'll change it to 50. The dictionary shows us what the word confidence means. Oh, by the way, the title of this message is Confidence in the Lord Required. Amen. Confidence in the Lord Required. It's not optional. Amen? Amen? The dictionary shows us that the word confidence means faith or belief that one will act in a right, proper or effective way. 
I'll say that again. Say it again, Sam. Faith or belief that one will act in a right, proper, or effective way. Amen? Amen. We have a bold confidence in who God is. We have a bold confidence in His Word, and we need to walk according to that. What we have to understand is what the negative report did to the people of Israel. The negative report set back that whole nation of people 40 years. The negative report of the, 12, of the 10 of the 12 spies set back God's plan 40 years. He said that whole generation would have to die except Joshua and Caleb. And if you read further on, you find out that those 10 spies died of a horrible plague. God made sure that their unbelief would never be spread through the children of Israel again. So he allowed them to be taken out. But when we get into the place where we don't trust in God, we don't trust God and His Word, we don't have this bold confidence in who He is and what He has promised us, we are setting back our victory. We cause the victory not to happen. We cause the growth not to happen. We cause the move of God not to happen because we come up with carnal news network headlines on all the reasons why we can't push into God or why we can't receive from God or God doesn't understand my situation. You may not word it that way, but that's what you project to God because you put more trust in your your ailments, or you put more trust in your weaknesses, or you put more trust in what you think you're unable to accomplish. It's because you're thinking carnal. It's you're thinking unlike God. Amen. Does God limit us? Do we limit us? Absolutely. Just the fact that we limit ourselves proves we don't think like God. Oh, I can't, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too smart, I'm too stupid. I mean, we come up with a million and one excuses why we can't do what God's called us to do. We come up with reasons why, you know, as husbands, we can't be the leaders of our home. We're content if our wife does everything. I don't see God's wife doing everything. Well, actually, God's wife should be doing everything. That's right. Because you are God's wife. Amen? This definition of faith explains the importance of having confidence and being a follower of Jesus. The Bible speaks about how it's important for us to live out our lives confidently trusting in the Lord and living in an effective way. You see, an ineffective Christian An ineffective Christian, I believe, doesn't truly know their God. And there is no reason why any of us should be ineffective. No reason. Oh, you can come up with a hundred of them, but there's no reason good enough why we should be ineffective for his kingdom. No reason why we shouldn't be laying hands on the sick constantly. Letting people know, hey, there's a place where you can get some help. You're addicted to drugs, you're addicted to pornography, come with me on a Monday night, I'll even take you there. You know, there was a survey done not too long ago. And the survey was this. How many people would respond to an invite to attend your church. And you know what the survey said? 82% of people X to go to your church will probably go. 82%. So that tells me people are not being asked according to that statistic, right? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. You see, asking is a very important aspect of our belief in God because we can't get saved until we ask Him in. We can't be free until we ask Him to forgive us. 
And we'll never bring revival if you don't ask someone to accept Jesus. Or at the bare bones minimum, bring them to a service. Right? If you don't know how to lead someone to salvation, well then lead them to the front door here. And let your pastors do the work. I don't mind. If they're here, we'll do it. That's what we're here for, right? You turn to your neighbor and say, I feel beat up. Good, I was just testing. <laughs> just testing. Amen. Now, what is confidence? Another, another way of saying confidence. Listen, God says that we are to trust in the Lord with our whole heart and lean not on our own understanding, but acknowledge him in every decision we make so he can direct our paths, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? There's trusting in God, and then there's confidence. Confidence could be worded this way, a bold trusting in God. More than just trusting him, it's a bold trusting him. It's an in-your-face trusting of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. How would you like to trust God in his face? That's right, we're going to do it. <laughs> Caleb did it. Oh, yeah, there's giants. They're going to squish us like cockroaches. Come on, we can overtake them. I'm sure, I'm sure Caleb didn't do one of these. Well, you know. I think maybe we can possibly knock down one. He said, let's get them, boys. There's no wimps allowed in the kingdom. God has not called you to be a wimp. Turn to your neighbor and check. Are you a wimp? If you're a wimp, call the number on your screen. Listen, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Once you were a wimp or a scaredy cat or a good for nothing, now you've got the almighty, all-powerful God who has anointed you to be a world conqueror and a warrior. That's you. That's you. Now, if that was your job description, some of you might be fired or laid off. In this economic times, we don't fire you. We just lay you off. You get the point? Hallelujah. We may sometimes lose that confidence in the Lord and become influenced by sin. People who are influenced by sin will become confident in themselves. And this brings us to the place of becoming prideful and arrogant. You see, when we start to backslide, when we start to fall away from God, when the fire goes out, we become prideful and arrogant because now we're basing our Christianity on our own abilities or lack of abilities. And then we come up with a million reasons why we can't press into God. Well, you know, a snowstorm's coming. So what? We can tread on serpents and scorpions. We can't tread on puddles. If you don't have that much confidence in the God of your protector, go buy new tires. Well, that sounds pretty arrogant, Pastor Vin. No, i just trying to open your eyes. Sometimes we need to see things a little bit different. Amen? No plague will come near my dwelling, unless it snows. I don't like the silence. It's deafening. Move on, Pastor Vin. Move on. Move on. They're going to attack you. They're going to rise up. Noah Webster describes the word confidence like this. And why do we look at Noah Webster? Because Noah Webster was a brother in the Lord. Pastor Anthony used to call him Brother Webster. Okay, because he was a, he was a, a man who knew the word of God. And in his definitions of the word, he incorporates scriptures to prove his point. Right? Number one, confidence is this. A trusting or reliance, an assurance of mind or firm belief in the integrity, stability, veracity of another. I had to look up that word veracity. That word veracity means the truth, the accuracy, and the reliability of another, or in the truth and the reality of a fact. 
Psalm 118, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. This is his definition. I rejoice that I have confidence in you in all things, 2 Corinthians 7, 16. Number two, confidence. That in which trust is placed. Ground of trust. He or that which supports. Proverbs 3, Jehovah shall be thy confidence. Number three, confidence means safety or assurance of safety. It means security. Ezekiel 28, they shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yes, they shall dwell with confidence. And number four, confidence means boldness and courage. Boldness and courage. Acts 28, preaching the kingdom of God with all confidence. So we see there is a fearlessness and a courageousness and a boldness that must come over us, which is the confidence of God. The confidence in who he is and the confidence of the accuracy of his word. We need to be confident what God said we could have is ours. Right? You're experiencing that, right? What God has promised in his word is ours. And we as humans tend to limit stuff. You know, I remember watching Sesame Street yesterday. No, not yesterday. <laughs> I remember watching Sesame Street, and there's one of the things I remember. I don't remember how the song goes, so don't hold me to the song. But I remember the point in the Sesame Street was good, better, best. And it was trying to you know, teach us young little kids the difference between good, better, and best. What happens with many Christians, they come from this place from good, and they stop it better. They have no desire to reach best. They have a good enough mentality. At least I'm not going to hell mentality. That's a defeated mentality. That is a weak mentality. That is a powerless mentality. I would even go as far as say that's probably a lukewarm mentality. Well, I'm not as bad as I used to be, but I'm not as good as I should be. So where are you going to be? You're going to live in the land in the valley of mediocrity, defeated and powerless. Rise up, O church. Rise up, O church. Rise up, you streamer. Rise up. Don't settle for second best when best is already promised to you. Amen? Amen? So the truth is we are not to have confidence in anything apart from God. Anything that is not from God, anything that is not a report from God, we have no confidence in. We have no trust in. We don't rely on those things because those things we taught a couple of weeks ago are temporal. And what is the definition of the word temporal? Anyone remember? Anyone remember? Subject to change. Turn to your neighbor and say, subject to change. Subject to change. change. Turn to your neighbor and prophesy to them right now, things are going to change. Things are going to change in your life. Things are going to change in your life. Things are going to change in your life. You're going to rise up and you're going to be a mighty man and a mighty woman of God. You're going to be a mighty husband. You're going to be a mighty wife. You're going to be a mighty child. Because it's for us all. Amen. Amen? You still love me? I didn't get to page two yet. Let's look at some scriptures here. 1 John 5.14. I'll give you a few minutes to get there. I'm going to read it in the Amplified. 1 John 5, verse 14. I'm going to start reading, I think, in verse 12. It says, I write this to you who believe in. See, he's not writing this to those who don't believe. He's writing this to those who believe. How many of you believe this morning? So he's writing this to you. If you believe, he's writing this to you. He's writing this to believers. 
not unbelievers. He's writing this to believers, not make-believers. You know, there's a lot of make-believers in the kingdom. They know how to say, praise the Lord, glory be to Jesus, and hallelujah. But there's no fruit in their life. There's no change in their life. There's no power in their life. Their confession is always negative, like the ten spies. Thank God none of you here. Amen. It says, I write this to you who believe in, adhere to, and trust in, and rely on the name of the Son of God. How many of you trust and rely on the name of the Son of God? Amen. Now, when, about a year ago, I did a teaching, and I taught in that word what it means, name. Name means the integrity of somebody's character. The integrity of someone's character. So it says here, I adhere to and I trust and I rely on the character of the Son of God. In the particular, excuse me, in the peculiar services and blessings conferred by him on men, so that you may know with settled and absolute knowledge that you already have life. Yes, eternal life. Verse 14. And this is the and this is the confidence, the assurance. The privilege of boldness which we have in him. We are sure that if we ask anything, make any request according to his word, according to his will, according to his word, in agreement with his own plan, he listens to and hears us. Verse 15, and if, since we Positively know that he listens to us in whatever we ask, according to his will. We also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us as our present possession the request made of him. Amen? So we have a bold confidence in knowing that if we ask anything of God according to his word, according to his purposes, that it's already ours if we have the faith to receive it. Amen. If we go in with doubt and we think, well, I didn't go to Bible school or oh, you know, I was raised without parents. And we, we come up with a million excuses why we can't receive this. You've already lost. You may not go back to Egypt, but you're already thinking like Egypt. You're already thinking like Egypt. Stop thinking like pyramids. Amen? They call that denial, right? Because denial is a river in Egypt. Proverbs 3, 26 says, For the Lord shall be your confidence, firm and strong, and shall keep your foot from being caught in a trap or some hidden danger. This is saying that the Lord is my confidence and he will keep me from sliding on ice. He will keep me from getting a flat in a pothole. He will keep me from getting caught in a trap. Amen? He, your King James might say, he will keep your foot from being taken. So that means when we have confidence in the Lord, we are sure-footed. We are bold. We are powerful. There is no devil in hell and no force on earth that can stop us except your own choice to be stopped, except your own choice to be defeated. In the garden, remember, there were two principles that man had to live by. They could live by the principle of obedience and obey God, or the devil came and caused them to reason. You could live by the principle of obedience or the principle of reason. Obedience is in the spirit, walking in faith. Reasoning is walking in carnality. Got to figure it out. Got to figure it out. Got to figure it out. Stop figuring and just walk in faith. For we walk by faith and not by figuring it out. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by the five senses that God gave us. Natural man survives by five senses. What it hears, what it sees, what it tastes, what it smells, what it touches. We walk above that. We walk according to faith. It doesn't matter what it smells like. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it sounds like. My God's word is true and I'm going to stand on it no matter what the circumstance is. Amen. 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 
We live today, you know, oh boy, the, the news. And you know what, the news networks, negativity, negativity, negativity. Let's just put fear in people. Let's just control people. We need to put faith in God, you know. Well, you know, there's a measles outbreak. You know what that means? It means nothing! Well, I've got to invest in gallons of hand sanitizer now. You have faith in sanitizer more than God being your protector. You know? Too many believers, you know, when sickness comes to their house, you know, sickness comes to the house. I don't care if it's measles or weasels or whatever, you know, you don't roll over and accept it. You are more powerful than that. See, this is evidence that the church doesn't know the power that it has. Well, you know, the flu's going around, so I guess we're going to get it too. Well, you already got it. You already claimed it as yours. You already got it. You might as well go get the sanitizer and the Kleenexes and everything else you're going to need to clean up the throw up because you just expected it. Or you can stand in faith and so no plague will come near my dwelling. A thousand may puke by my side, ten thousand at my right hand, but it will not come near me. The one thing I hate in this world is throwing up. That's like on my, my top two list. Dying, then puking. <laughs> not my cup of tea. For those that have been praying for me not to become bulimic, don't worry. It's not going to happen. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Come on, you got to laugh in church, right? Did I offend anybody by saying puke? I'm sorry. Not going to stop me from saying it. Hebrews 4:14. And the Phillips translation says this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Amen. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has entered the inmost heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to our faith. Hold firmly. Use two hands if you have to. Use crazy glue, whatever it takes. For we have no superhuman high priest to whom our weaknesses are intelligible. For he himself has shared fully in our experiences of temptation, except he never sinned. Verse 16, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with fullness, with fullest confidence that we may receive mercy for our failures and grace to help in the hour of need. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So not only do we get mercy for our failures and our past mistakes and we get that under the blood, but we get his grace, his overcoming power, his overcoming ability that we need whenever a need arises. That way we don't fall to reasoning. Amen? Do you know you can reason yourself right out of the blessing of God? Matter of fact, that's what reasoning is for. Carnal thinking will rob your faith every time. Natural thinking will rob your faith every time. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. This will be the voice translation. Let me know when you're there. My wife is fast. Not a Nosa Bible. Philippians chapter 1, 3 to 6. It says, whenever you cross my mind, I thank my God for you. And for the gift of knowing you, my spirit is lightened with joy whenever I pray for you. And I do so constantly because you have partnered with me to spread the gospel since the first day I preached to you. Isn't that great? You know, ran into this guy, led him to the Lord, right? Accepted Jesus in his heart, got his sins forgiven. And that very same day, that guy went preaching. Since the first day. Since the first, since day one. Well, you know, 
I don't know anything about the Bible. No, but you know about redemption. You just experienced it, right? Because you have partnered with me to spread the gospel since the first day I preached to you. Verse 6, I am confident that the Creator, who has begun such a great work among you, will not stop in mid-design, but will keep perfecting you until the day of Jesus, the anointed, our liberating King, returns to redeem this world. Amen? Amen? Hebrews chapter 10. I told you I'm going to be reading a bunch of scripture. I'm reading scripture so you can hear the word so faith arises, okay? Hebrews 10, verse 32 to 39. Are you there? Amen. This again is the voice translation. Instead, think back to the days after you were first enlightened and understood who Jesus was. This is speaking to those that have been discouraged. This is speaking to those that have fallen, you know, their fire has dimmed. You know, I talked a few weeks ago, you remember, about me saying when I was a young man, I used to hear preachers talk about, and Christians talk about, you know, when, when you're first saved, you're on fire for God, but then the honeymoon period is over. That's a lie. I mean, even in the book of Revelations, Jesus is telling, you know, one of the churches, return back to your first love. Remember how it was. Remember the excitement. Remember the zeal you had when you first got saved. Regain that. Regain that first love. Get back on fire for God. Just because you got what you wanted in prayer doesn't mean you give up. You know, sometimes people go to God because they have a shopping list of everything they want. And when they get everything they want, they, put, they sit back and they put their feet up on the coffee table and say, life is great. You're deceived. Instead, think back to the days when you were first enlightened, when you first got revelation and understood who Jesus was, when you endured all sorts of suffering in the name of the Lord, when people held you up for public scorn and ridicule. This is a blessing, huh? Or when they abused your partners and companions in the faith. Remember how you had compassion for those in prison and how you cheerfully accepted the seizure of all your possessions. Sounds like today knowing that you have a far greater and more enduring possession. Remember this, and do not abandon your confidence, which will lead to rich rewards. Simply endure, for when you have done as God requires of you, you will receive the promise. As the prophet Habakkuk said, in a little while, only a little longer, the one who is coming will come without delay. But my righteous ones must live by faith. For if he gives up his commitment, my soul will have no pleasure in him. My friends, we are not of those who give up hope and so are lost. But we are the company who live by faith and so are saved. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Proverbs 14, 26 says this in the Amplified. In the reverent and worshipful, worshipful fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. And his children shall always have a place of refuge. Amen? Amen? God is good, isn't he? Amen. How far in are we, Tom? 48 minutes. Okay, two more scriptures and then we're going to close and pick it up next week. Amen? Amen. Last scripture. 1 John 3, 21 in the Amplified Bible. 1 John, that's in the back. Not the gospel, but the epistle. And beloved, if our conscience, our hearts, do not accuse us, if they do not make us feel guilty and condemn us, we have confidence, complete assurance and boldness before God. And we receive from Him whatever we ask, because we watchfully obey His orders 
We observe his suggestions and injunctions. We follow his plan for us and habitually practice those things which are pleasing to him. Amen? Amen. How many of you have a vision for your life? Amen. How many of you have a vision? If you don't know what that means, how many of you have a goal for your Christian life? Is it an impossible vision for you? It should be. Your vision should be greater than your ability. If your vision is to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken after service, that's not a vision. That's your stomach speaking. And that might even be carnality speaking too, okay? If you have a vision for yourself and it's impossible for you to do it in your own strength or where you are in life right now, well, that's probably a vision. A vision is a long-term goal that almost seems impossible to happen. Now, the way we get that kind of vision is by having short-term goals and short-term vision. But these visions must be visions of faith. These are little steps of you doing little feats of impossible things. Little steps of supernatural, not steps of natural. You know, one of those steps is not, I'm going to go to church Sunday. Mm -mm. One of those steps, I'm going to go to church Sunday, and I'm going to be used in the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. If you're not being used in the gifts of the Spirit. Right? Those that came out to the conference, we were taught, we learned that God desires for us all to prophesy. Right? God desires for us all to lay hands on the sick for them to recover. God desires us all to cast out devils. But I'm afraid of the devil. Why? He's already defeated. Well, he might make some noise and hurt me. Well, then you're misinformed. The only thing he could do is, is growl and scream and yell a little bit. Right? He's not going to hurt you. He's defeated. If you think he's got more power than you, he'll always have power over you. I'm not saying the devil doesn't have power. But as a Christian, you're exempt. Because your power is greater than his power. And he's been defeated by the one who lives in you. Amen. For the world, for the unsaved, for the lost, the devil has power because he's controlling their lives every single day. I'm not talking about even devil worshipers. I'm talking about people who just live about their life doing normal routines apart from God and don't know God. They're controlled. They're blinded. They're being led by the devil. We're greater than that. The greater one lives in us. We are the agents of their salvation. We are the ones that have called to rescue them. Right? We could do it, right? Amen. We can lay hands on the sick. You can lay hands on the sick and they'll get healed. You want to come to church three weeks. You could do that. Right? Just like I could do that. Just because I've been coming here 38 years. That's not the reason why I could do that. It's because the same God dwells in me that dwells in you. That's the only reason why I could do that. And because I have faith knowing with true, true boldness and confidence that when I walk in obedience to laying hands on the sick, God does his part. I do mine. God does his. It's a great partnership we have. It's a great partnership. We, we're in cooperation with one another. Amen? Greater things shall you do than Jesus himself did. Amen? So how many of you feel like you've become emboldened today? How many feel a little more confidence today? How many feel more victorious today? And if you don't feel anything, that's good because feelings don't matter. Receive it. Walk in it. Demonstrate it. Act upon it. God talks about hearers of the word and doers of the word. Hearers of the word live in a place called self-deception. You imagine you're doing the job of the devil. The devil's the deceiver. We say, no, 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 devil, sit down. I'll just deceive myself. I'll do your work for you. you don't even, I give you the day off. I give you the month. I give you the year off. I'm just going to sit here and be deceived. Or you can act upon the words you've heard this morning. Amen. And the words you heard last Sunday. And the words you heard the Sunday before. And the Sunday before that. And if you forgot what they said, you need to go 
review your notes, right? You need to review your notes because simple things like what does temporal mean, subject to change, that should be something, you know, if I believed in tattoos, we would have tattooed on our arms, right? Because that's, everything is subject to change. Everything is subject to change. Amen? So review your notes. Watch the videos. Get the CDs. Maybe we'll even upgrade to some kind of MP3 media for you guys that are now computer savvy techies and all that stuff. Right? Young people don't know what cassette tapes are. They look down in the basket, they go, what are these things? You know? I mean, some of us still have cassette players. I still have a cassette player. Right? I might even have a couple eight tracks laying around somewhere. Don't have the player though. Right? But as technology moves forward, so do we. Why is it the church is always the last? We're supposed to be the innovators. We're supposed to be the creators. Our God is creativity. He is a creator. And we too are creators. Go out and create some salvation. Go out and create some healings and miracles. Go ahead. Do it. Through the creativity of God that's in you, you can do all things. Amen? Come on, give him a praise this morning. If you're watching by way of Ustream, I have good news for you. Jesus loves you. We love you too. If you've never opened up your heart and asked Jesus to come in, I would like to lead you in a prayer. It's very simple. Jesus said that religion is just as good as a whitewashed tomb. Looks all holy on the outside, but it's full of dead man's bones. And we're not talking about religion. We're talking about having a relationship with God. Relationship means that not only do you pray to God, but God speaks back. And you learn his voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And a stranger's voice we don't follow. So if you've never invited him and you would like to experience this power of salvation, maybe you want to receive a healing right where you are. Just say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you just as I am a sinner. I acknowledge that Jesus died on a cross for me, buried in a tomb, and rose again three days later victoriously. I ask you now to come into my heart to fill me with your spirit and to forgive me of all my sins, to heal me of all sickness and disease, to make me that new creation that you promised me to be. Fill me with your boldness. Fill me with your zeal. Give me a hunger and give me a thirst for your word and for your spirit. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for healing me. And thank you for making me your child. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, there's a number coming up on the screen. There's an address. If you contact us, we would love to send you a free gift, a Bible with a little information on how to use that Bible. All right. Your past no longer exists. In the records of heaven, today is a brand new day. Today is the first day of your brand new life. I want to encourage you to get into a church that teaches the word. If you live local, if you're in the Flushing, Queens, or in Queens, New York area, I invite you to come and partake in our service here every Sunday, 10 a.m. You're more than welcome to. Amen? Why don't we give the Lord a praise? Hallelujah. Thank you. See you next week. Amen.